So I give you Gar Alperovitz. Thank you, Don. Uh, my mother would have appreciated that very much. <laughs> I had a wonderful dinner here this evening with the members of the board of the Land Trust, so, and, and I asked them what I should talk about. I, I, what I, and what I meant was, uh, I'm not interested in giving a lecture. Okay, so anybody who came for a lecture, now's the time to escape. Uh, what I'm interested in and I ask you to participate in this discussion in this way is not to listen to what I have to say as new information, some guy came and gave a talk, but is there anything in it that the person in your seat might do about any of the things we talk about? So uh, that, that's what we used to call in the 60s a heavy rap. The question is existential. You, did you come to listen or did you come to, what can I do with the conversation, okay? So that's the context. Uh, secondly, there's a lot of practical things that we've been doing in the Democracy Collaborative and that uh, we can talk about. I'm gonna give you a web page, so we're gonna come back to it. It's www.community-wealth.org. Be sure to put the dash in because there's another uh, website with, without the dash. And you will find in this a, a great deal of detail on various kinds of things that community groups now do to change, basically to change structure and ownership of wealth. So for instance, the most obvious one in this group would be a land trust. And you'll find a whole section on latest information on land trusts, what's going, state of the art, research, who's doing what, hopefully we cover the ground. But you'll also find information on uh, some 11,000 worker-owned companies in the United States, 11,000. There are more people now involved in one or another form of worker ownership in the United States than there are members of unions in the private sector. The American press doesn't cover that, but it is very conventional, very common. Now, they, and they come in different flavors. Some of them are very good, some are not so good, but they are out there as a conventional changing, uh, let me use a phrase, it's a conventional changing of the ownership of the means of production in the United States that's going on all over the country. Um, you'll find co-op information, you'll find information on uh, nonprofits in general, but also nonprofits that are involved in community service, sometimes called social enterprises. And there are a range of those. There's four or 5,000 neighborhood corporations. There are lots of municipal corporations where, where the city is trying to go into enterprise in order to solve either environmental problems or land problems and make profits for the city. There's a lot going on on the ground. So that website will give you a feel for it. There's some of it discussed in my book as well. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but I wanted to give you that as a background. Third, uh, we're doing a big project in Cleveland that's gotten a lot of press lately. And there's an article in the last week's Nation that, that, that I wrote with some colleagues, Time Magazine, um, The Economist, Business Week, Several magazines have covered it recently. And it's a very interesting project involving land trusts, worker ownership, et cetera, et cetera. And if I don't talk about it, which I may not, somebody please, if you're interested, ask me a question about that. And I want to, two other questions that I want to put on the map so that when we get back to them, if you're interested, we come back to them. I want, I'd love us to get to this place, but it usually best at the end, is does a capitalist system have to grow in a way that destroys the environment? And if so, what do we do about that? So we'll come back, I'm, this is, sorry about this, what we're doing is seeding the audience with ideas. <laughs> we're seeding the environment with things that I don't wanna forget, okay? And, and finally, the question that Don raised, which is regionalism. Genuinely, what do you do about a continental scale system if you want a democracy, okay? So anybody, please remind me if you're interested that if we don't get to those, those things. Now, the, the place I'd like to start this discussion is a, with a, an experience I had during the anti-war movement of the 1960s. And a young organizer took me door to door um, during the anti-war period. And we, he said, I'm gonna teach you something about politics. 
and you're going to learn from me. And I was, you know, a professor, and, and he was just a, he was a really young kid, activist kid. And I'm going to show you something. And what he did was he walked me door to door in the city, not of Cambridge, but in one of the industrial suburbs of Cambridge. Uh, I think it was in Somerville, as I recall. Height of the war when the entire Congress, except for three people, were for the war. The president was for the war. The major news enterprises were for the war. The television was for the war. The period before Martin, before Martin Luther King made the courageous step to oppose the war, which it took him a long time to do because it hurt the civil rights movement. He took me up door to door and he started knocking on the doors. And people would say, well, you know, I'm against the war, but nobody else on this block is. I'm against the war, but nobody else on this block is. And what we, we'd go door to door, not everybody, but a large number of people actually agreed that the war needed to be ended, but didn't know how to act. So if you think the system needs to be changed, possibly your neighbors may have those feelings too, but they don't quite know what to do with it. And in fact, the question most people ask most of the time, and what they're really interested in is not really what should we do in the sense of all the models that are available. There are plenty of models available of the good society. The question that people really are interested in, and I'm interested in, and I suspect some of you are, is there any way to conceive of changing something like a political economic system of the most powerful system in the history of the world? That's the real question most people actually are asking and worried about, and it's kind of right <laughs> below the surface. It isn't for many people, and I suspect the kind of folks who come to a meeting like this, uh, I suspect many people here would like to see major change of one kind or another. But the issue is deeper. It's not it's about politics. It's about social change. So let me address that and we'll come back to, I have a lot of thoughts which I'd love to share with you about, what do you do about designing the next system? There will be a next system. History is not over yet. Uh, how do we think of it in new terms? And I'm going to back off and give you a, a way to think about it that I'm developing for myself. And it's a new book and it's, it's also a way I've tried to come to terms with some of the oddities of this particular advanced corporate capitalist system. And the way to think about it for me is this. Many of the European countries have had the capacity to mobilize what is often called a social democratic solution to the problem of corporate capitalism. Now what does that mean? In this country we call it liberalism. That means that the core institution of the economy is the large for-profit corporation. And everybody knows it has an uneven path, its growth, its environmental implications, its equity implications are very severe. And the role of politics is to mobilize different groups to keep it in, in check, to clean up the environment, to change the distribution of income, to provide welfare programs, etc. That's the model. It's not a socialist model. It's not, very interesting, but those are who, it's not even a free enterprise competitive capitalist model. I've been reading a lot of conservative economists, genuine conservative economists, for whom I have great respect and disagree with. The Chicago, founders of the Chicago School of Economics, Milton Friedman's teachers, understood that what we now have was nothing like what they were talking about. They thought the giant corporation was destroying capitalism because it organized power and then organized it politically. And the real free competitive market was of inter individual entrepreneurs and large and small medium-sized firms was thrown, was thrown, thrown aside. And with it went, went freedom and liberty and democracy. I'm talking about conservative economists. H.C. Simon, the founder of Chicago School and the revered teacher of Milton Friedman. So what you now are looking at in these systems are large corporate structures. And in all of the European and in our own system, attempts to hold them in line somehow. In this country, we're finding failing attempts as the weak attempts. I want to set it up that way for, because it's an important way to begin to think about where we might be politically and historically and why I think that way of thinking about it opens a possible path forward. And here's, how, here's one way to look at it. The, you really need to start, begin to think about how different our capitalism and our social democracy really is from most other countries. We're not going to give you a lot of figures, but here's a couple. The United States now, and this is a measure 
It's a good measure. I sometimes use the word outcome trend. It's a good measure of how powerful our progressive politics is in the traditional modality. That is to say, holding the corporation and managing it. The United States is, ranks 117 in inequality amongst all of the world's economies. It is next to Turkmenistan and Ghana in inequality. Now that's a disastrous way of thinking. It's a horrible thing. But it also tells you how weak we are in our capacities to manage this system historically. 1% of American wealth owners in the United States today, 1%, own just under 50% of all productive assets. That's a medieval design, and I mean that not rhetorically. 1% having half of the productive assets in the country, and that's, where, that's your society. 5% have 70% of the productive assets. And with those numbers comes extraordinary power. Another way to look at it is the United States federal government is about 22% of the GDP. If you add in the states, you get up to 30 or 32%. In most other European countries, the range is at 28 to 30 at the low end, up to 45. A measure of how weak our politics in the traditional mode to manage the problems of a large corporate capitalist society. There are many, many ways of looking at it. We don't have, many countries have free college education as their politics has generated that. Many countries have free daycare. Many countries give uh, family leave paid. Many countries, I could go on, you know the story. So we are almost last in virtually every one of those lists. The importance of that, and why it's a good starting point, is that, I'm gonna offend people. I'm gonna offend some people. I come out of liberalism. I worked for House and Senate staff. I was a, a staff director in both the House and Senate working for liberal congressmen and senators. Senator Gaylord Nelson, the founder of Earth Day, I was his legislative director. I come out of liberalism. I'm, that's my background. Wisconsin liberalism. Excuse me? Let's hear it for the liberals. Yes, well, that's where I come from. Uh, the, and I come out, of, come out of Wisconsin liberalism, which is a really progressive version of, of liberalism. Uh, that's my background. Our goal was and is, and at that time, and I still, I still affirm this goal, was to organize political power to constrain the corporate system. We never asked whether the system ought to be changed. Or could you achieve any changes in major trends that way? And let me be harsh, Ed, but over the last 30 years, there has been no change in income for the bottom 80 percent, wages for the bottom 80 percent of workers, zero. Corporate incomes are going way up. So the question was, does that form of politics actually work in this particular capitalism, given the history of this particular capitalism? And the outcome trends in most areas of the environment, not all, but most areas of the environment, the outcome trends are either negative or, or stand put. Uh, in most areas of income, income distribution, it either, gets, it either gets worse or is stable, and there's no evidence that we've achieved anything. Many years ago, a few years ago, we passed legislation, much hailed legislation, and I was for it, and I still am, to increase the minimum wage. Probably people here were for that legislation. Yes, you, okay, that's a liberal achievement. I come out of liberalism. I'm with that. There are probably there are other people here, some, maybe one or two people out of liberalism. <laughs> I'm going to, this is, I told you, this is a heavy rap, okay? The achievement of raising the minimum wage brought it back, not quite to where it was when John F. Kennedy was president. The minimum wage in real terms has gone down, and what we were able to do is prevent it from going much further down. We are, if you think of what I'm talking about is in system terms, liberalism is a resistance movement, not a progressive movement that can advance its values. It is resisting negative trends in the distribution of income. It is resisting negative trends in the environment. It is resisting negative trends in terms of democratic capacities. We are by far the least liberal nation in terms of imprisonment. We are seven times as many per capita 
lose their liberty and are imprisoned in this country than any other society. We are very close to China in that regard. What, our, what that politics that I have come out of in most, is that we attempt to slow down this process. Thank God, I'm for that. But if we're interested in changing the trends, there will have to be much more radical change. It's obvious. And a lot of people aren't interested in changing the trends or they think that more fundamental change is not possible. Both are reasonable positions, that it may not be possible to do more than be a resistance movement. Fair enough. <laughs> I'm not so sure. I'm a historian. And what one knows about from history is that societies in great decay, in great pain, in great alienation, have a way sometimes, not inevitably, but sometimes, of beginning to throw up answers that are new answers because of the pain, because of the decay, because of the problems that are growing. Another way to say that is, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. used to write about 30-year cycles when he thought the pendulum would always swing. I suspect there are a lot of folks in this audience who hope the pendulum will swing. That's a formulation and theory of politics. It's a crude theory, but it's what most progressives actually, including, actually have in the back of their mind. Maybe we'll elect somebody new in the trend. We will talk about the trends because the trends are too hard to face, but maybe something will get better. And it's useful. I'm suggesting to you that in this particular corporate capital system, the pendulum is not likely to swing but deeper processes of change may well be building up that are of great importance and that we need to pay attention to them if you stand back from history and look forward thinking about where does this go over the next three decades. All right, let me switch back and give you a different way to think about it. I mentioned to somebody at dinner tonight, and in the, you'll find this in my book as well, that my heroes in the United States are the civil rights workers in the 1930s and 40s. It's very easy to join a movement when there's a movement moving. It's very hard to lay the foundations for the next transformation. Partly because it's very hard to do, and also because who knows, there may not be anything. You may be just whistling in the dark. And in particular, the people in Mississippi could easily be hung, and many of them were from a tree by trying to do something. So people who have the courage in the time of potential prehistory to think that they, I'm talking to the person in your seat, to think that they might, we might possibly be in a period of establishing the potential foundations for a transformation, rather than the pendulum might swing and we can slow down the decay. Those are the people who interest me a lot in history. Uh, those are the people that bring me to talk to you know, folks like you guys, because I suspect some of you are in that place. I think that we are actually entering the most interesting period of American history that I have ever experienced. I think it's far more interesting than the 60s. And the reason is the 60s raised issues of civil liberty, civil rights, environment, and then they came right up against the economic power and stopped dead in the, that Martin Luther King movement when it got to the poverty issues was dead in the water before he was assassinated because the power of the game was in the economic sphere. And I think Americans are beginning to enter a period where the economic issues cannot be ducked and secondly the environmental issues cannot be ducked. That's a large order challenge that when it is confronted, nobody wants to confront that, but when you are forced per force of economic and social pain to say, something's really wrong. Not, gosh, if we elect the next guy, it'll be all fine. No, no, there's something deeper that is wrong. I think that we are in an era where that idea is being driven up against millions and millions and millions and millions of America. And that is the precondition of saying, by God, something different is going to have to happen. Not the inevitable precondition. Societies decay. Rome decayed. Societies turn to violence. Fascism can happen. But societies also can build. 
and renew and have revolutions. We had one, the American Revolution, Shays' Rebellion, right around the corner. Things also are possible. So I am a very cautious historical optimist, prudent optimist, and I'm interested in what the prehistorical possibilities of the next great change might be. That's our time in history. Yours and mine, if you follow what I've suggested. It's a potent time, potentially, of great importance. So here's where I start with it, and what I've been doing, and some of the things that I've been thinking about, and let me give you some sense of why I am a modestly optimistic. I see people at the local level struggling with problems that they used to think if you elected the right guy, it could be solved for them, might happen. And they now know, Bob Swan, one of my great heroes, knew this early, what Susan knows, they now know that you can't leave it to them. That doesn't mean you shouldn't elect, <laughs> politics is important, I'm not saying, but unless there is genuine change at the local level, it ain't gonna happen. Now we know that as a theory, but what I'm saying is that what we're seeing in the work that we've been doing at the Democracy Collaborative is vast numbers of people actually doing that. Now the press, the press is dying anyway, but the press doesn't have the money to cover it and they don't cover it, they don't want to, they don't think it's an interesting story. But when you see after city after city after city where poverty and pain at the local level is going on, people being forced to try new things, usually forms that change the ownership of wealth in mini form, like a land trust or co-op or a worker-owned firm or municipal ownership or all the things I was talking about, that's coming, it's hard to do. Land trust is not easy to do. Tough thing. And when Bob really was talking about it 30, 40 years ago, nobody was talking about it. Getting that down and actually doing it is the preliminary question you need to solve. By the way, over the last five or six, land trusts have been on the margin of society for a long time. People would not take them seriously. Chicago now has a massive land trust. Washington's got a massive land trust. Irvine, California is building 10,000 units in land trust. They're exploding all over because you can't solve the problem without changing the ownership pattern. Interesting. Interesting that an idea on the margin per force of events is forced into the mainstream as now becoming conventional. The same thing's happening, by the way, for city ownership of different, you know, we're doing this in Cleveland, but you probably know about capturing methane, turning it into electricity, socializing that, municipalizing it, providing jobs, et cetera. That's happening all over the country because of the crisis, financial crisis and the environmental crisis. An idea that was way on the margins now becomes, well, we need to do that because you can't solve the problem another way. That sort of process is happening in worker ownership, cooperatives, land trusts, social enterprise. We follow this stuff so we see a lot of it. And my view is that it's happening because the, because the traditional way of solving problems and the way many European countries can still do but we are an exception, that we have a much weaker social democratic capacity, that I think is going to be a really big deal in this country because it's already expanding and exploding. And you people, many people here in this room, are part of that. So, and I think that those, those of you who've been involved with Schumacher Society or Schumacher's ideas, that idea took a long time to get to the place where anybody took it seriously. I think you're going to see a real explosion based on the fact that there are lots and lots of models out there and the pain is growing. At quite a different level, so that's in roughly good times in America. That's the period from the 1960s to now. As the pain level deepens, and it will deepen, we can go into that at great length why that's happening, why the, why the public system does not have the power to allocate resources through taxing and spending, the power is dead, dead, deadlocked and they're going to cut more and more, and why the stagnation is built into the economic system now. Those of you who are not economists, let me give you the simple version. If workers' wages don't increase, and don't increase, profits increase, who's going to buy the stuff? That's a recipe to, technically for stagnation. And it means, doesn't mean that you collapse, it means that you stagnate, you get a little bumps. And we're entering that period clearly. 
And if you don't have, if you can't tax more because the people resist, and you can't spend money, problems build up. And that period is also en we're entering as well. I think that is a hopeful scenario. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you why. Because I think if it were to collapse, I don't think it would go to the left. And if it is, the term I use, if you have an environment historically of stalemate and decay, but not collapse, it is a time for learning, growing, and building, and learning enough to actually generate the preliminary ideas, practices, and people for a much larger possibility. If it collapsed, you wouldn't have time to learn and develop, and I think we do. I said I thought this was the most interesting period of American history I've ever lived through. It may be the most interesting period of American history, period. I say that because the elements that are developing point in a direction that is well beyond capitalism. It's also well beyond traditional socialism. The model that's beginning to emerge, and we can talk about this, at the, I'll, talk, talk, I'll talk briefly about what's happening at the national level. The model is changing who owns capital, not the 1% or the 5%, democratizing it, attempting to democratize it in a way that respects the environmental constraints, mo most and many of these institutions I've mentioned, have that built in rather than having to come after the fact and regulate. It is a model that is highly decentralized and changes ownership, because if you don't change ownership, you can't change the political power structure. Let me say that again, fellow liberals. Liberalism thought you could do in the United States what, possible, what is possible in many European countries, change the relationships and the outcomes without changing the ownership power relationships. That was the idea. And that's the idea that's challenged, I think, by history now, and it's the idea that's challenged also by the new models. They are different. That's happening at one level, and I think as we move in the, into a period of stalemate and decay, you're going to see a lot more of that building on the wealth of experience that is out there. You want to build a worker-owned firm? I can tell you who to call. 35 years ago, you want to build a land trust? Not many people to call. You want to build a worker-owned company? Not many people to call. You want to do really interesting co-ops? Agriculture maybe, but not, not urban. Not. Today, and it is a great historic achievement, there are experts and people all over the country who can tell you actually how to do it. They know how. That's, that's it's something that we can build on. So that has been developing and I think will develop intensely as the pain level increases. And it is also cultural. There is an idea growing about how to do these things. I sometimes say to my friends working in the Cleveland Project, I'm not interested in co-ops. I'm interested in the idea that they offer us ultimately for politics. Say that again. I have, of course I'm interested in co-ops. But the notion that there is a way to think differently about the principles of the next system is more important ultimately politically, and particularly for younger people. It's like the old Bob Swan's original. You didn't think about the principle of a land trust, and now it's a broad principle. How does that happen historically? Now, let me take that back. How do people like us make that happen in the prehistory of the next era of great change? I don't want you to get off the hook. We're on the hook, all of us. We can't avoid the hook. So I think that's happening, and I think it's very important because it's generating principles. At the national level, I think there are several other processes already happening also because of the weakness of this particular form of capitalism and its social democratic possibilities. So one of them you see right before your eyes, the healthcare system. I mean, every other advanced nation long ago has had a universal healthcare system. Everybody knows that. But the problem, and whether or not it goes through in, in the Obama form, uh, it's, you know, it's dicey. It is obvious to anybody who takes a longer look at the trends that that system will be socialized over the next 20 years. The, the financial pressures are so great, the divisions amongst the corporations that are benefiting from it, health the insurance companies, the pharmaceuticals, the hospital companies, they are, each one has different interests and they're being divide, divided and conquered. But most important, 
The American corporations are against this system, the large corporations, because it's too costly in international competition. So that system is going to be forced into Medicare for everybody over time, in my judgment, and we can go into that in great detail. Uh, I think you're talking about that path is all but inevitable. It's a very different process. It's a process generated by the failings of that particular sector. Now, it's important because it's 20% of the GDP, a fifth of the economy under a very different structure. So that is another big piece. What's interesting about what's happening in finance and banking is, again, because you do not have the capacity to manage them in the old way. You can't regulate those guys. You can in theory, no problem. You can in theory regulate them in terms of their banks not having individual positions where they can risk. You can regulate them and make them have more capital. You can do all sorts of things, too big to fail. All of that is possible. But in fact, in practice, you do not have the power to do that. So what you're going to have, I mean, most financial experts are very clear on this. You're going to have another crisis. And maybe you'll be able to break them up. That's the, that's the favored remedy now. The too big to fail, break them up, make them littler. And what we know about that is that once they get littler, the big fish eat the little fish and they're right back at the same trough. That, that banking system ultimately is going to be a candidate for either collapse and crisis or some form of, of public ownership. And again, that, I swing that over a 20 year cycle. The dynamics are very different from the capacities of many European countries to manage those systems. Now, if you listen to what I'm saying, I'm, I'm suggesting to you that the oddities, this is sometimes called American exceptionalism, the oddities and weakness of our system, but it's, but it's strong enough not to collapse, put it in a very different cycle from, whoa, if we all organize, we can get the corporations to do it, or maybe the pendulum will swing. I call the cycle a reconstructive pattern. There is the possibility of institutional redevelopment at the local level, institutional development of a very different kind at the healthcare sector, institutional development in terms of banking. I think we're going to see transportation shift in the auto companies, two of them are nationalized. Now that's very primitive stuff, very badly designed nationalization. But some parts of those systems, when we go to mass transit and rail and high speed rail, nobody in this country makes that stuff. So who's going to make it? You're going to buy it from the French, you're going to buy it from the Japanese, or ultimately could shift some of that production to companies. Could be worker-owned companies. Could be worker-owned nationalized companies. What do you mean? Well, General Motors, Chrysler, are <laughs> worker-owned nationalized companies in very primitive form. But that model, I suspect, will see a lot of experimentation, particularly in sectors where there's heavy taxpayer money and the demand for jobs and buy local and all taxpayer cash as the pain level increases, I think those are going to be pragmatic models that can be built upon. And we can go on, but what I'm going to say, suggest to you is this weird and paradoxical idea. And if you even peek into this slightly positively, rather than say that's way off the charts, the beginning points of a very different design are evident in different parts of the society coming out of a fairly successful period of history, moving into a period of great decay where what is really going to be demanded is new design principles out of the pain. The old stuff don't work. We need a solution. The new stuff is in development. It is, in my view, a staggeringly interesting period of prehistory. Maybe not. Societies do decay. Violence does occur. Rome did decline. Fascism does happen. But also, maybe not. Maybe not. Real good evidence. There's a lot of vested interest. Check this out. We have a vested interest, all of us, in believing nothing can be done. Don't have to do anything if you believe nothing can be done don't have to struggle with these very nasty problems if nothing can be done. So I always say, check, check that. Maybe so, maybe not. My own view is that it is clear that many of the things that people are already doing are important in their own right. They offer positive things to do. You are doing them in this area. The next stage, this is where you've got to 
rise up a little bit, the possibility that you are laying groundwork in the prehistory for a possible transformation, that takes a little bit more. It takes something like the American feminist movement did in the 1960s. Uh, you know feminism was a ridiculous idea. <laughs> Challenging the most powerful cultural institutions and relationships in the society? Are you kidding? Most people in that period, my mother couldn't work, it would be something that would be bad for the family. Not only about the, raising kids, but that would be a bad signal that my father couldn't properly support her. My mother was a, you know, intelligent woman who could have been a lawyer, a doctor, whatever, but the culture did not allow that in the 40s and 50s. That was broken in half out of people doing something in transformative ways. Civil rights movement did it, the early environmental movement did it, the anti-war movement did it. One of the things I suspect many people in this room know and younger people don't know. People don't, younger people don't know what a movement is when it begins moving. They don't have that experience. Some of the gray hairs in this room know what it is when people actually begin to react both practically and morally and reinforce each other to create real change. Then, then you have something that's very different from elect that guy politics. Then you have real dynamism. Now, I may sound like I'm a utopian. I'm a very hard-headed Paul. And I'm a hard-headed historian and a hard-headed economist. I think the possibilities of that kind of thing growing out of the emerging conditions that are quite specific in this country are quite real and that to discount them is to miss, or I wouldn't even say miss, it is to delay the possible development of these changes. So let me give it to you in a different way. The most interesting thing that's happening politically in this country, politically, if you read it carefully as a historian, is the Tea Party stuff. Now, what they are, the Tea Party movement. Now, the Tea Party movement's got a lot of crackpots. It's got a lot of right-wing nonsense, in my opinion. It's got a lot of free enterprise talk. It's got a lot of anti-government talk. But at, at its core, at its core, what those people are saying, I'm from Racine, Wisconsin. Those are my people. I mean, folks that I grew up with and went to, went to high school with. What they're saying is there is something really rotten about the government cutting deals with the big corporation and taxing me for something that doesn't work. That happens to be true. The progressives ought to be saying that. That happens to be true. And they ought to be damn angry, and they are. Where are we? The problem is they want to go back to an archaic idea, and they're being manipulated by the right, and they're being propagandized. And the only way forward is the nasty stuff. If you can't go back to free enterprise capitalism, and you can't use the old liberalism that I certainly came out of, you are going to have to talk about changing the system. You're going to have to talk about changing who owns the system. And if you're interested in democracy and the environment, you're going to have to talk about it in a way that is practical, damn practical, expanding, democratic, and real. So, my uh, modern heroes are people who are actually thinking about laying the groundwork for the next big change. Those are my heroes. Any and all of you can play that game. The resistance is not in the political system yet. The resistance is in us. This is not about why don't those guys do something. It's about why don't we do something. Yeah. Well, <laughs> now, so here's the, te here's the test. I'm going to give you a test. You know, you, gotta, you, know, you shouldn't have invited me. <laughs> Here's the test. Will you, can you, spend one hour a week doing anything about this? One hour. Will you study? Will you call a group together? Will you say, what can we do here that takes us another edge down the line? Can we learn about something? The test is one hour a week. Very hard test. 
Nobody wants to do that. They want to talk about that. So that's the test. The person in your seat, I'm giving you a test. And you can look in the mirror tomorrow morning and say, well, I don't know. <laughs> but that's it. And I'll give you actually a practical way to proceed. Uh, my, I got a lot of heroes, but one, another group of heroes is the early women's movement. And what the early women's movement knew was something else. Chairman Mao said that power grows out of the barrel of a gun. And the women's movement said, no, 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 no. Six women get together for coffee once a week, study, figure out something practical, reinforce each other. That's where power comes from. And they were right. So, you know, probably people in this room have six friends. You could get together for, you could read, you could learn about what's the most advanced things being done, you could study a little history in terms of what other societies have gone through. Then you could say, what could we do that moves the ball a little further than what we've tried here? Pushes the envelope just a little further. Talks about it. And by the way, you're going to be called socialists. But you're being called socialists anyway, so it doesn't really matter anymore. <laughs> Uh, if, you talk, if you talk about changing these things, I mean, that's, hap that's really one of the most interesting developments that anything in the liberal spectrum is now called socialism. So you might as well play with worker ownerships and co-ops and land trusts and you know, public ownership of this and that, socialized medicine. You're going to get tired with that brush. And then say, show me a better way to do it if you've got an idea and that it'll work. I mean, the language, the rhetoric's all gone, forget it. So that's my test team. Now let me come back because I remembered what I was going to tell you, tell you about Cleveland. Cleveland's really interesting. And I also remember I was going to tell you about growth and then you can sit me down and forget about it. Uh, we went out to Cleveland uh, three years ago. And we know all about, one of the things we know about is a lot of stuff going on in the country and the web page is interesting. And we, we had uh, tried to do at the national level bringing people together from these various areas that shared the principle of changing ownership Practically, uh, land trusts and you know co-ops and worker-owned companies. And we had a big meeting, and we had it out at the Aspen Institute, and we had all the national leaders are there. And we thought, if they got together, they'd see they kind of have similar ideas. <laughs> and of course, that was so naive. Um, they all went home and did their thing. It was they were all in their silos, right? They did good things. I'm not knocking what they did, but the notion that they could bring something together did not occur. So then we did. By chance, it was Cleveland for odd reasons, just could have been any city. And we said, well, let's see what happens locally, because people are doing all this stuff locally to bring them together. Maybe there's this, they'll see something in common and something will happen. So we, we had a day and a half meeting, leadership of these various groups. Also, importantly, and I didn't mention this, but we could get into what states are doing. State public pension funds are investing in interesting things. States are owning investment in new technologies as ownership, not just te not owning as ownership changing the relationship. So we had some of those people there from the state uh, investment side. And uh, what we did was just display, we brought in some people doing interesting things from different parts of the country. Did you know you can do X? Oh, they're doing it over here. And did you know you can do Y? And you got just knowledge is really important. People simply did not know what is actually being done and can be done. You want to do it? Here's his telephone number. That's just how they do it. He'll come in and talk to you about how to do it. So knowledge turned out to be very important in that community, and I think in any community, because there's so much practical knowledge out there that gives people heart and inspiration about what can be done. A complicated process followed that. But what is going on now in Cleveland, great leadership group, uh, picked up on the notion that this is not just about green jobs. This is about green ownership. So. What's happened there is, uh, some of you may have read about this, there is a large co-op built on the Mondragon model and designed for geographic impact. Everybody know about the Mondragon model? Yes? No. No. Mondragon model, okay, Fair, very interesting. It's like land trusts here. 50 years ago, a little bit over 50 years ago, Catholic priest in the Basque country of Spain now, you guys live in America. The Basque country, Spain, is where, where Franco shot down a lot of people and hung the rest. Really nasty politics. Coming out of that during the Civil War, coming out of that, how do we get jobs for our young people? And this, this priest and then some younger people began setting up what, what, what was a particular form of co-op. And it is a production co-op 
but it is designed in ways so that if you set up a new co-op, it's part of the same system and they don't break away and it's, there's a center, central bank, a central fund. So there are 100, now 100 and I think 110 integrated co-ops, high tech, very successful financially, some of them green, some of them not, um, service industries, manufacturing industry, advanced research, very, very successful businesses uh, employing over 100,000 people in this form. Uh, Y'all love this. The current ratio of, of CEO to worker, average worker in the United States is it's between two and 300 to one. In 90% of the Mondragon is the name of the region and the town, 90% of them, the ratio between top and bottom of highly successful, very successful, not, this is not your corner co-op, it's highly successful, very high tech, four to one. In the other 8%, it's nine to one, that's the max. So that's a really interesting model. Read about it. That's what your study, by the way, your study group, pick it up because it's really interesting to look at. Um, so the model in, in, in Cleveland is based in part on the Mondragon design. So they're not one co-op, but an integrated group of co-ops in one geographic area, trying to build up a culture and structure. Uh, the first firm is a, a industrial scale green laundry. It's the most, it's the greenest laundry in, in the, maybe in Ohio, but certainly in the northern part of Ohio. And it, it's operational now um, for the last six months. The second one is a solar installation in, uh, company, co-op, worker owned. The third one, which will open in about two months, is a, is a um, greenhouse, a 10-acre greenhouse uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, the cold weather like you've got here, with the capacity to produce uh, 5,000 heads of lettuce a day. But these are not minor things. The next, the next one is there's a newspaper being developed. They're going into manufacturing all around this same model, but in the poorest part of Cleveland. Average income is 18,000 in this part of Cleveland. And the model is, is uh, it's interesting in that respect. It's also interesting to me in a very different respect. So you can do things if you want to is the, the point. And you want, this is much tougher area than you live in. It's really poor black area with very difficult situation. And the model's building and there's a lot of interest and probably a lot of other cities will pick up on it and so forth. What's really interesting about it, so now we, we get to design principles. It is not simply floating in the capitalist market. I use that phrase for a reason. Because if it were, and if it is, right now it's fine. It is competitive. This is not being subsidized. But it is also directing its market at big hospitals in that area and universities. Some kind of, technically, sometimes we call them the anchor institutions. And that's important. They're willing to buy from them because they want the environment around them to be better and because it's goodwill and because there's a little political pressure on them, so forth. But the model is particularly interesting in a different respect. Energy, which is one of the other sectors, and health are expanding sectors. They're not declining sectors. So the growth path of this form, by design, is likely to expand on its own. You're not in a situation where it's a declining area and people are killing you to get in. More interesting for the long haul is that the model is likely to be open to political discussion. It is important, like it is to give contracts to women, to minorities, to small business, it is important to give contracts with public money, health and energy, all are dominated by public money, to in companies that change the wealth pattern and anchor jobs in the community. So it has a political thrust to it that is, has qualitative reasons. Anchoring, by the way, worker-owned companies have another advantage. It's not just about changing and democratizing ownership. They don't get up and run away. People live in the community. And that's really important when we have, a, as a society, allow the corp corporations to come and go and throw away communities. Literally, we throw away cities. You build up housing, you build up roads, you build up sewers, you build up schools, et cetera, and hospitals. The companies go and all that goes down and you've got to build it again. It's ridiculous. Worker-owned companies are particularly interesting in, respect, in this respect because they anchor and save the capital and save the environment. So there's an edge to the model. There's a real edge to the model because what I've just designed for you in terms of principles, I didn't design it, but if you, if you think about it, that is a highly decentralized, cooperatively based, very democratic, 
community-sustaining, environment-enhancing, wait for the punchline, <laughs> community-sustaining, environment-enhancing model linked to a planning system with public impact. In this case, the planning system is a healthcare system with public dollars and energy. That model is different from most models. It is a decentralized model, radically decentralized, but also linked to a planning system. Now, it isn't called a planning system. It's called the healthcare sector. But it has it in it, when, you begin, when we build our mass transits and our rails and our high-speed rails with public money, that planning system is going to have to purchase from somebody. That public planning system. That design is different from corporate capitalism with liberals trying to push it in the right direction but don't have the power to do it. That's a different model, highly decentralized. All right, I'm just about done and I remembered the last ones and I'm gonna sit down and let you guys talk. Um, you can drop Germany into Oregon and Washington together. I sometimes tell my students, those dinky little European countries, you can drop most of them into Oklahoma, <laughs> which is true. This is a continental system. It is very hard to manage. We are at 300 million. We'll be at 450 million in, in about 35 years. You tell me how to, have dem have, how to have participatory democracy in a continental system of 450 million people. You solve that problem, you get the Nobel Prize. It's not possible. Can you do it? So ultimately, for a variety of reasons, and I think we're seeing some of that now, that the, the system is just too large for any democratic control. Ultimately, if some of the, most of the states are really too small to manage as political economies, and the continent's too big, the thing intermediate is called a region. So I suspect what we're going to see in this process is as Washington is stalemated, and as some of the states try to take action, a lot of this will move to the regional level. New England has experimented already in the environmental area. California is a region, and when it goes through its crisis and comes out the other end, you may see California getting really interesting when that thing tips over and goes the other direction, because that is a region. So my own view is, if you're looking for design principles, in the period of prehistory, going forward at these various levels of what you can do locally, what may happen because of the national crisis in healthcare, finance, et cetera, are really interesting. But it's decentralizing to the regional level, I suspect, is where it all comes out. Now, one last, one last thing. Of course, none of this may ever happen. It's all maybe pie in the sky. But the interesting thing is virtually anything you do locally on this subject, or in terms of politics, or in terms of pushing the progressive side of what might be done in a state like Massachusetts, or Connecticut, all of which are within your grasp. All of that, if it doesn't transform the principles and become the prehistory, all of it is really useful to do anyway. <laughs> so, thanks for having me. Sorry to bother you with all these problems, but uh, look in the mirror tomorrow for one hour.